So just click, click OK. So this is going to be recorded on Zoom, setting up your meeting. One moment, redirecting to Zoom. OK. Hello, this is live feed. Just That's click, wonderful. Click, okay, so this, this is good. good. Oh, that was an echo. And now we're going to click record. Record on this computer. Three, two, one. This meeting is being recorded. <laughs> Hello and welcome, everyone. Welcome back to fractalu.com. <laughs> welcome, boys and girls. I'm Dan Winter, as you know, and I'm here with our co host, Tufan Guven, geometricmodels.org. And our host, I'm sorry, our guest speaker tonight is the amazing Dr. Ralph Otterpohl, professor in Germany, a specialist in regenerative agriculture and holistic uh, use of the land and return to a healthy, natural, balanced lifestyle. Amazing. Uh, Dr. Ralph was with us here, visited us in France, and it was wonderful. <laughs> Dr. Ralph is one of my favorite people. I'm so happy he's here tonight. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I just, we'll just take a moment here to see if we have any uh, announcements for FractalU.com. Um, uh, as you know, that next week is the big moment when Patrick Bauti, uh, our programmer for FlameInMind.com and the new PiezoFire.com will be with us announcing the release of the new PiezoFire.com with the software to go with it. And the devices are ready, thanks to Tufan, and that's a very exciting next week. And also, uh, Dr. Shelley Evans shared some amazing results, stories with Piezo Fire, which will shortly appear as a short film clip on the website, piezofire.com. And she's with us tonight. And thank you again, Shelley. Uh, so let's see, do we have any other announcements? Well, uh, so this week, um, our wonderful friend, uh, Medrick DeGoy, launched a new web website, Elfi. E L F I E Elfie dot link, which uh, in which he greatly expanded the number of physical constants and variables, uh, physical dimensions predicted by the PlancFire.com equation. So radically expanding our idea of how charge collapse is the origin of so many physical variables. We want to thank Medrick, and we'd like to invite you to check out Elfie E L F I E dot link. Uh, and also, uh, new at the top of plonkfire.com, uh, today's uh, uh, children's fairy tale metaphor picture is uh, a memory moment from the Wizard of Oz, <laughs> basically. Uh -huh. And you can see the new graphic at the top of plonkfire.com. Basically, it's the yellow brick road and <laughs> the, the lion and the... Uh, Tin Man and the Scarecrow and Dorothy approaching Oz, which is the Emerald City. And it says, you know, of course you knew that the yellow brick road was the golden mean spiral. And you knew that the Tin Man was the brain, the heart, and courage. But did you know that staying awake in the poppy field is the physics of how you wake up inside a lucid dream doing during the golden compression at the center to reach a crystalline array called the Emerald City, which is a longitudinal coherence array within which the reality of lucid dreaming and how you survive death and heaven and collective unconscious, they propagate in an Emerald City. I mean, an Emerald Crystal. I mean, a longitudinal array. So actually, when, as you open your eyes with new understanding to look at the Wizard of Oz, we see <laughs> amazing physics that actually, since clairvoyance and the physics of lucid dreaming is now teachable as a science of longitudinal coherence, we can take a whole new level, level of meaning from what's inside the Emerald City. And if I look like a wizard stepping out from behind a curtain, it's only a coincidence. Don't worry about it. <laughs> uh, Tufan, did, did we have any other announcements? Did I carry on? What do you think? Uh, we are good. Just a quick notice that the following week, we'll be talking with Edessa Tiernan and Hannah Spence, who have extensive um, experience on with kids. So uh, we will talk about the Terrify, Quantify Plasma experiences. We'll have fun. And we will also have new information on our upcoming um, uh, September event, hopefully. Great, yes. Yeah, no, Elasa and uh, Hannah, speaking two weeks from now, uh, have amazing stories of their work with young people 
and uh, really uh, the, the magic kids. So it's wonderful. There'll be several talks around that when also Ice, um, Alexa and Iris from Amsterdam, from Netherlands will be speaking also about their work with how kids see uh, with the inner vision. So uh, without further ado then, we're going to announce uh, Professor Ralph Otterpol, professor from Germany, who has also tested the Therify, and we're researching the dramatic effect on germination growth. He's tested imploder products, and he's become really our uh, agricultural uh, science leader here. So take it away, Professor Ralph Otterpol. Thank you, thank you. Thanks for coming. <laughs> yeah, uh, hi, Dan. Hi, Tufan, and all the others. Thank you for being here. It will be Great, and I can announce that I have a first time uh, um, thing that I will show you. And uh, so that's quite exciting uh, for me as well, because from the preparation for this presentation, I had an insight that was absolutely fantastic. And uh, yeah, I will go over uh, the basics of regenerative agriculture and why it's crucial for survival of man mankind. Uh, nothing less than that, and I mean that. Uh, and then how important it is to also look at the more subtle levels, the information level, uh, energy level, and uh, that is now also confirmed by agricultural scientists that see that this is the most important thing to begin with. So I'll sh uh, show some slides and... Um, so this is uh, where we are, sacred geometry. And uh, I will now present my slides, and that is uh, on fine-tuning ourselves with nature, conscious harmony with the land. Uh, so uh, my uh, main points, restoring soil on all levels will create natural abundance of water, food, and balanced weather conditions. To raise happiness levels in your region, do regenerative agriculture uh, and gardening, and then the nutrient density will be rising, so it does taste better. And at the same time, humans can develop to their full potential. Parts of the, well, bad situation uh, humankind is in at the moment is that the soils have been so deteriorated that the food is crap and doesn't contain all the things that we urgently need to uh, develop ourselves, including our brains. And I have written a lot of that in my book, Garden Communities. Um, and then um, I will uh, start uh, to explain about how to uh, work in the field, so in the field with the fields, <laughs> with the subtle fields on the land, so to say, and this is uh, requiring uh, our conscious perception, and then we can uh, restore the living plasma lines on the land. Thanks to uh, Dan, it's like also my uh, vocabulary now to, to, to talk about uh, the plasma and and so on. So I'm really happy to get to a more scientific language here. And then finally, humans and nature can co-develop uh, to their enormous potentials. And uh, this includes the new earth that I believe we are, uh, well, co-creating. And all these techniques and a lot more, whatever resonates with you, what makes your heart sing, Learn it, do it alone or with friends and teach us. We need a few more millions of people doing these things. So to begin with, these are the two options of uh, humankind. So we can go for the desert planet. And unfortunately, this is enormously profitable for a few idi idiots around the world that uh, are sort of uh, so greedy and... Uh, limited in their view. So they are small people that are having big money and uh, too much power and uh, they profit from destroying the land with agrochemical industry and uh, this has a whole lot of consequences. However, 
the desert planet will not happen because many parts of the world are restoring mainly through the activity of the people themselves, very rarely government programs. And then we get to a green earth and to sort of uh, do away with some uh, fear mongering on a green earth where we restore the dry lands and uh, bring the land to fruition with uh, forest gardens and so on, even 30 billion people could live in wealth. And that's something, isn't it? Not saying it's it's good to have that many, but uh, the, well, all the propaganda to many people on earth is something about uh, like, making us feel bad, and there is no need for that. And now, let me introduce to you um, one of the biggest soil scientists of all times, and that's obviously Professor Dr. William Albrecht, who lived from uh, 1888 to 1974, and he um, became prof at University of Missouri in the United States. I want to quote him, because this quote is explaining everything about agrochemical agriculture. In 1940, he was saying NPK formulas, and I have to explain for people not familiar with agriculture, this is nitrogen, phosphate, potassium, that's the normal uh, fertilizer that farmers buy in large quantity, and uh, it costs them so much, and uh, now see what it does. NPK formulas, as legislated and enforced by state departments of agriculture, mean malnutrition, attack by insects, bacteria, and fungi, weed takeover, crop loss in dry weather, and general loss of mental acuity in the population, leading to degenerative metabolic, metabolic disease and early death. And, well, this uh, can be called prophetic almost, but this was not even all the craziness with the pesticides, fungicides, and all the sites, biocides, but just by putting mineral nitrogen mainly into the soil. This is uh, creating a situation where humans lose their brains. And we are maybe already too far in that, uh, but uh, well, I guess we get this going because I will show how easily we can convert to regenerative practice and get the nutrients back into the food that we eat. <laughs> and yeah, they, they by the way, that, that, yes, please, Ben. Dr. Ralph, they said that uh, after World War II, the U.S. actively passed so many laws to eliminate family farms and enforce agribusiness, which aggravated this problem, obviously, even though the, the farm boys are what won the wars. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, and this is ongoing. And uh, luckily, we have a resurgence of family farms. And I'm really glad about this. So people in regenerative agriculture, they will have a profit and they can serve their uh, surrounding and their uh, neighbors. Uh, and so they make a good living while providing people with excellent food. And now the takeover of the farms uh, by the banks is sort of like um, a little bit of help to those investment companies that want to take over the world and uh, that should not happen, and uh, this should not be supported so much. And so there is something to do, and so we should uh, find better ways. So this quote, um, uh, pour notre ami uh, en France, uh, en traduction. <laughs> and now the story of the olive oil. So now... <laughs> olive oil. So it's one of the very rare good seed oils. A lot of seed oils are crap and make us ill and deteriorate our brains like the uh, canola oil and uh, sunflower oil. Avoid this like the best. And um, to the contrary, 
olive oil has great properties and one of the properties is obviously um, the, the polyphenolic uh, acids that it contains and people around the Mediterranean uh, are pretty healthy because they eat a lot of good oil. Now uh, we have what is called the olive illness and yeah, many many of the trees are ill and dying. And now uh, people I met in Switzerland on my last speakers tour, they have specialized on mycorrhizal fungi. And mycorrhizal fungi, if you never have heard of it, they are the best friends of the plants. Uh, they are in symbiosis with uh, the roots and they push deep down, get the nutrients the plant needs on, uh, on their wishes. And the plant just returns some sugars from photosynthesis. So that's how nature works. But now crazy people put fungicides and destroy the land by putting mineral nitrogen. Uh, and uh, so these mycorrhizal fungi are often gone. Is, is that like uh, as in micro rhizome? Is it micro? Is it R yeah, H? Uh, these are uh, they are synergistic with the plant roots, and so they make one meter of a plant a thousand meters extension by mycelium, and is, is that's that, uh, that's absolutely the word, stunning. That, that's as in the word rhizome, micro rhizome. Yeah, that's the, where the word comes from. So they are yeah. uh, connected to the rhizomes and so the, yeah. the roots. And so it's a symbiosis that's absolutely stunning. And now here are the results on olive oil. So these guys from Switzerland, they had specialized on that. They had a contract with a huge farm in uh, Italy with uh, 7,000 olive trees. So really a huge estate. And they had the problem of dying trees and so on. And uh, so they applied mycorrhizal fungi that are very, very specific. There are probably hundreds and even thousands, uh, ten thousands of species. So you must pick the right ones and find a company that is not cheating you, what most of the companies do. And they did that. And so they applied them to these uh, 7,000 uh, olive trees. And the result was that the trees grew much better uh, very, very soon. Um, and then harvest season came and uh, olive farms are making the test for polyphenolic acids because that's the quality um, uh, parameter. And so they usually had 250. And uh, so that's considered a very good olive oil. Now, when they had uh, applied the mycorrhizal fungi and the next harvest, the first lab said, oh, our machine is broken. We can't tell anything. Second lab, the same. And uh, the fourth lab then from the US gave results and it was more than 2,000. Uh, that's, that's the polyphenolic acid content in the olive oil. Right. Yes, so yeah. one of the main compounds that makes us healthy. And this was rising to incredible numbers if you compare it to crap. <laughs> and how, uh, did they, how do they generate the microrhizome? Um, is it a microrhizome fungi or algae they add? or? Uh, yeah, they can only develop with living plants. So that you grow the plants, then they develop the mycorrhizal fungi. And by the way, the easy way to harvest them is you go into your region, find, find the plant that you want to improve and find very old cultures that were not uh, poisoned and um, uh, were standing very long. And there you can dig a little bit of soil, put it to the to the roots of the other plant and then you can also like inoculate keep it wet and put it into the soil not on top and so this amazing result this is only one example so that's my olive oil story but this relates to almost all crops okay. and plants imagine what 
the food has become. It has become something where our brains are not working properly anymore. But where it is spreading. <laughs> but do you give suggestions on where to buy the mycorrhizome uh, uh, injection or the? Uh, well, so special. I, uh, the Swiss people have a company in Poland that they find. I can pass this on to people that are interested. We can maybe also give the link. Uh, but it's a specialty. So that's something where people yeah. really yeah. need to go into it. Pretty uh, tricky but, to get it. Uh, yeah. yeah, but, but where the, where the uh, soil is still good, you will find them. But they only live with plants. So they don't come with the compost. Now... Going on, so going back to the screen. The um, slideshow. Yes, the slideshow. Okay. Yeah, there we go. And so that is uh, a stunning thing. And now um, another stunning thing. We have developed the best rice cultivation system in the world uh, by intercropping dry rice with beans. And this mm. system can easily save 15 to 20 percent of the world water resources and just imagine nobody is interested so problems are really something where you can earn a lot of money you can make careers in ngos and so on so the problem profiteers don't want the solutions and so they uh, cultivate the problems and make money of that so the solutions must be done by us the people and so the word must be spread so help with that please now and what did the, the leg legume was it because the legume was a nitrogen fixer is that why it worked or uh yes that's that was our idea to to put the nitrogen in but what made a lot more um, uh, advantage for the farmers was that it was suppressing the weeds because the, the beans are growing so fast. So the leaf is covering the soil and you don't need to have all the weeding. What is the problem otherwise in dry rice cultivation? Uh -huh. So yeah. that's something that can be applied right, the way, right away, connected to SRI rice, where Cornell University is uh, the leader. And they were giving us congratulations on that, and I hope this will spread. <laughs> um, but yeah, by now intercro to, by, yeah. by intercropping, did they mean that the one row of rice and one row of beans? Is that what they mean by intercropping? Yeah, in between the rice plants that are wider spaced, uh, there is always one bean, and so that provides the nitrogen and uh, also a, a, an additional crop. <laughs> the ground cover too. Yes, I see. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Yeah, and, and uh, less evaporation and all that. And, and imagine 15 to 20 percent of the world's water resources because rice, uh, paddy rice, dry ri uh, wet rice is, is eating up so much water that yeah. people don't have any in the cities. Yeah. Even Java with 2000 millimeters of rain per year is running dry because of the <laughs> rice cultivation. Yeah. But yeah. now to the story of the soil, and that's the crucial thing. So a plowed soil becomes something like concrete. If you don't plow and you have direct seeding and uh, regenerative agriculture, you make a nice living soil that will infiltrate the water. So to compare, flooding and drought is caused by dead soil. And also that what is called climate change is largely the disruption of um, the weather patterns of the water cycle and uh, destruction of the soil and could be reversed easily by restoring the soils around the world. Then we get back to the clouds and uh, evaporation and all that. So the living soil makes groundwater research, recharge and the soil is like a sponge. And we had all these floodings, especially in northern Germany. And now this was a TV report, um, the picture um, or above uh, or on top is a conventional farm, uh, agrochemical, plowing and applying NPK fertilizers, flooded, wet, muddy and not workable anymore. The neighbor who is working regenerative, no, no till, and uh, well, all the good things of regenerative agriculture 
has no problem. He doesn't even need boots to go on the land. And so this is now spreading because more and more farmers see what is going on. Mm. But now, yeah, the, the plow actually, uh, the metal plow actually sort of shorts out the land and in itself the plow alone is, is kind of kills a lot of the microorganisms, etc. Plus it uh, disrupts the living enzymes and so the plow is yeah, absolutely absolutely and shallow mm. shallow plowing can be okay grubbering and it should be with copper tools and uh, yep. so yeah As uh, Steiner so, Steiner yeah, yeah 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 and uh, yeah now to the heroes in this field and uh, this knowledge is like uh, more than 100 years old but it was suppressed and pushed away, especially after the Second World War. And now it was brought back through, you, through the US. And one of my heroes is Ray Atuleta, and he actually was a um, uh, employee of the USDA, US Department of Agriculture, and a trainer for farmers. So he was an official, and he realized that he has sort of uh, teach nonsense to the farmers for 20 years and he had the guts to say okay i have now learned how to restore soil and he became a huge uh, voice for regenerative agriculture and partly developed it and he was making great presentations and how here the column uh, in front of the lady uh, the left hand side uh, from where we look that is plowed soil, so it dissolves in water. And uh, on the right-hand side, the same amount of water had been applied and the soil keeps together. So it's like a sponge and uh, so nutrients stay in and so it infiltrates water. Mm -hmm. Then one of his um, students was Gabe Brown. So he learned from uh, Ray and Gabe had... Uh, has a farm of 2,000 hectares, so really, <coughs> really huge, North Dakota, the worst climate in the world, and he rescued the farm by going regenerative, and he restored the soil, and the great thing is that he is really a, uh, a presenter, so he really loves to present, and his success combined with what he could reach out with his YouTube channel was changing the world. And so <laughs> thanks to YouTube. <laughs> and uh, that's one of the great advantages. Another important thing is the holistic plant grazing. Uh, and that's uh, made popular in modern times by Alan Savory, but yes. came from uh, André Voisin from France also a long time ago. And that inspired Alan. And so it's like uh, small portions of the land and then the animals pass on the next day. And that's also what uh, Gabe Brown is applying. And so this intensive grazing with a lot of manure is sort of intensive uh, fertilization. And then the herd goes on and doesn't destroy the soil. And, and the, the trick is it, it very uh, disciplined uh, rotation of where the animals are are grazing. So it's the, the land goes from the grazing sequence to the growth sequence, and so the rotated yeah. grazing is really a, a genius. It's being taught around the world now. It's wonderful. Yeah, it's absolutely wonderful. And part of that, I believe, that we are not getting to the desert planet. Instead, uh, instead, uh, so many people are moving to these systems. Or also in Europe, we're a bit slow in Europe. I have to admit, uh, France is the fastest with regenerative. I have to say, oh, and okay. also Switzerland to some extent. But U.S. North America is so far ahead because so many more people were doing this. And one of the key things to spread this is the presentations by Gabe Brown, but also the book. Finally, he has written a book, Dirt to Soil. And I know personally farmers who have converted their land by just reading this book. And they nice. were successful. Nice. So from, from this work, it was uh, the regenerative agriculture, the five principles. And, well, that's still what is taught by many, but something is missing. And 
This is now the work of Dr. David Johnson, another of my heroes, um, uh, and uh, he is at New Mexico State University, professor, and he is a great, great uh, researcher and uh, makes practical application. Back to the NPK that makes us lose our mental acuity, <laughs> and it doesn't even feed the plant. So, uh, upper left, uh, upper uh, left nitrogen and its effect on plant growth. So, plant growth is the red columns and application of nitrogen, soluble nitrogen in nitrate is not helping the plant. So where soluble nitrogen is zero, the yields are the best. And by the way, also the taste and the uh, nutrient density and so on. Similar phosphate, potassium, and not even organic matter. But now here's the thing, the fungal to bacterial ratio of the soil microorganism has a correlation that is unheard of in agriculture. It's absolutely stunning. So that's the key issue. And now uh, Dr. Elaine Ingham, uh, the, the, the greatest uh, soil scientist, soil, soil biologists uh, in the world, soil food web, uh, she has also explained this. We need to have a, a fungi to bacteria ratio uh, if we want to grow grain of one to one, roughly. But now, almost all ar arable land, and also what we measure in our research, is like 0 0.01 and uh, maybe 0 0.1 to 1. And that's the ratio that is ideal for weeds. Wow, great job farmers. So, so it, essentially this is saying you need more fungus than bacteria basically, the healthy fungus. Yeah, is at least one to one and uh, that's something what uh, is also done now in regenerative agriculture more and more and this is now uh, uh, Professor uh, David Johnson, and he has developed a specific type of composting. And without going into the details here, because like it's just uh, giving you a little bit the taste of it. To increase the fungi in your compost, you cannot turn it. If you don't turn it, you must bring in the oxygen, otherwise it will not be good compost. So he had the great idea to put in pipes uh, with holes to bring in the oxygen. And this compost, now the species count, this is after four weeks, this is after 22 weeks, the species, you see from here to here, enormously more species. And this is where the compost is normally brought out. And now what he discovered, if you leave it for a year, look at the species number now, Rum. And this is absolutely incredible. And this becomes a like soil starter. And many farms do this now. Also in uh, Germany, there are many uh, farms that run uh, Johnson Sioux compost and you don't need a lot. So it's, it's like just sort of a activation of biology, bringing in a lot of soil fungi. And there is also some um, compost researchers that are making another step to bring in the mycorrhizal fungi because those only, as I said, grow with the living plants, with their roots. Now, so that, that's that's a they call it inoculum. In other words, they're yes. inoculating. And are are the majority of that in harmonic or that inclusiveness there are the majorities of those fungi or bacteria? Uh, at least you have plentiful uh, spores for fungi now. And uh, the, fung the fungi can only develop if you don't turn over all the time because then the mycelium is always destroyed and you will create bacteria, but not the fungi. And ah, so, so is, uh, oh, that's, hmm? that's fascinating. So the key in, in composting is you need to get the oxygen in, but you can't be turning it over all the time, basically. Yes. That's to get and to it. 
Yeah, and, and put enough woody stuff in because wood it what is what feeds yeah. the fungi. <laughs> yeah, we, we knew that that rotting wood is so useful, important for all of this. That's very true. Even rotting wood in the ground below your garden is. But so that's yeah. you got to get the oxygen in, but you can't turn it too often, and you need the wood in, and that'll encourage the ratio of fungi to bacteria. Very fascinating. Absolutely, and uh, a little shout out to our friends of biodynamic farms um, put a little bit of uh, uh, cow dung in because that increases the number of good species enormously and yeah. so the biodynamics have a lot of this but uh, also they they might also learn but it's hard for them so because they know everything they it's hard <laughs> for them to learn <laughs> but, they, My they did, so. <laughs> but they did they did use the steiner principle which was a vortex with piezo rock powder in the water that yeah. generated a huge amount of charge in the vortex so they, yeah. they did some things right as well absolutely no i <laughs> no doubt about that uh, yeah. but uh, as long as they plow their land, they will go nowhere. So that's yeah, also yeah. something. Yeah, and this now, is a very, very important insight about the fungi. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and now we had five elements or five principles of regenerative agriculture. Now, here comes seven elements of regenerative agriculture. And that's like brought up by me. I don't know if some people are joining in, but this is bringing in Johnson Sioux and enriching soil biology is step one. And uh, we have a new step one later because I learned something in the uh, preceding week. <laughs> step two, adding missing trace elements to get started later biological regeneration, mycorrhizal fungi will get it from the depths. We have the biological transmutation and all that. So quickly, the seven elements, uh, improving soil biology. So that's like putting in a little bit of uh, inoculation compost, Johnson Sioux compost. Step two, supplement missing macro and micro nutrients in the soil. If we want to produce nitrogen in the soil, uh, by biology, we need molybdenum. And if molybdenum is missing, we get nowhere because the system is not getting started. So that's why I have put this in as point two. And um, yeah, uh, shout out to John Kempf, who is a pioneer in that, and uh, Dr. Stefan Hügel in Germany, who did a doctorate with me and is now pioneering in this field in uh, Europe. Point three, minimal, minimal disturbance of the soil. Do not plow or dig. The same applies to gardening. Then permanent soil cover and deep rooting even in winter. Point five, species rich green manure or cover crops. And then continuing, keep livestock in proportion to arable land, rotational grazing. And that's very important because we cannot go on with like treating animals like they are treated in industrial operations. This is a disgrace to the human race, uh, pun intended. And uh, this is something where we should bring back the balance between land and animals. And then animals and their manure are in, 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 in enormously beneficial whether you eat them or off them, it's a different story. But we need the animals, animals especially, especially the cows with the horns. And the old species cows, not the Holsteiner that is uh, giving bad milk, A1 milk, so we need the A2. And that's one of the advantages of people living in France because they have these old races of cows and get better milk and that gives them additional few years of lifespan. Point seven, include agroforestry, and that's my special field, species rich wood production with fruit tree, uh, food trees and shrubs and so on. And you can make bioenergy from that, not from uh, food, but from like what grows food at the same time and then wood gas and combining that with steam engines is a nice thing. So these seven approaches work together, implement them all. You can check with the BRICS, and the BRICS unit is something where you can measure easily 
the well the nutrient density. So now the bricks bricks measurement is basically light refraction to measure sweetness density, isn't it? Do I? That it is. Yeah, that that's it. Uh, yeah. And um, the thing is that um, the the bricks. So maybe you can see it here. Uh, you yeah. put some uh, sap of the plant, and we compare the leaf, not the fruit. Fruit is wide ranging, and uh, for the fruit, for the for the uh, leaf, we can compare over all the plants, and we should get better than twelve. And that's really, as you say, it's a refraction on uh, sugars, but they represent the nutrient density. The higher the bricks, the more nutrient density and yeah. in, in in wine we have the better taste and that's also because the nutrient density is better and uh, so that's the the bricks important instrument and there is also something now that is called bricks farming and uh, people can take this to the shop so they can really go to their favorite uh, organic shop or to their farmer and test this and they can tell them you are not good at all. Why do you have only like seven or eight in your uh, leaf of your of your uh, crops? That is unacceptable. I don't buy that. I go away. <laughs> and when people are wisening up and know how to measure, <laughs> this is something what is uh, life changing. Loss yes, of mental acuity can be reversed, and we know how. <laughs> <laughs> Years ago, we were trying to measure life force in food, and we succeeded to some extent, flameandmind.com slash life force, by measuring capacitance, which is charge density, but that measure is very tricky. But here, it's rather simple. You're essentially measuring light refraction, which is sugar density, which is actually nutrient density. So you can measure the food for nutrition yourself and determine <laughs> and be a conscious consumer. <laughs> Absolutely, and and it's representing also how good the soil is. So if there is twelve and above, uh, the soil is great, and it doesn't work in greenhouses. So a hint: greenhouse stuff is less nutritional value. And uh, the thing about the um, the vital energy in food that is um, the um, well the biophoton measure measurements um, by uh, Professor Pop. I, I personally met him, a uh, great man, and, and so he could measure the light in the complete darkness that was given off by leaf and so on. And he said personally to me, uh, whether it is agrochemical or um, uh, organic, the time after harvest is crucial. So the life force disappears relatively fast. So we should have local supply our own gardens, and that gives really us the yeah. life for. <laughs> it's, so <laughs> it's ironic that the commercialization of food was entirely based on storing it, but actually life force inherently is lost with storage. So it's it's a great irony. that. Yeah, and it's a, it's a big support, a big support to pharmaceutical industry. So uh, some people yeah. knew what was going on, I guess, but now we are wisening up. It's a bit slow, but we are getting there. But so, you, you know, eventually, my, as, we, uh, as we design things like uh, implosive capacitance, orgone like refrigerators, you know, your refrigerator is mm -hmm. metal, so immediately depletes the capacitance of the food, whereas it, implosive capacitance would help slow the rate of loss of life force. But that's another story. No, please, yeah, please yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, well, this is if we understand what we do, we can make great things. Yeah. So, my Previous thinking, seven elements. So conventionally, five principles. Now my seven elements. And now I go to another step. The most important factor is still missing. So you all guess what that is. Uh, and so that's something where um, I'm really happy to show you some things that are the missing step in getting real regenerative agriculture. So the stolen from Tufan. Uh, and uh, so this is the energy grid of our planet. And now this energy is vital 
uh, to all plant life and to our crops and to ourselves and everything. And so now I have made a little um, representation of that. Vital energy, plasma charge availability is crucial for how well plants develop and how happy people can be. And uh, so the charge, I picture this by a fully charged battery and, uh, well, our sun. Um, and it, it, it's not, um, yeah, uh, easily uh, discharged. So this charge is for us for a long time. Unfortunately, there are many suckers and uh, many things that have been destroyed by uh, ruthless construction and not knowing uh, what uh, engineering does. And so the flow of vital energy into the landscape, uh, like with this uh, orange line, uh, there are like parasitic entities that suck on this. And this is my own personal experience and it's very, very common. Almost everywhere, the, um, well, the, 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 the level of energy in these lifelines for all of us and for the plants is at maybe 30%, 25% what it would naturally have if everything was right. And so um, also railway lines are very uh, dis disruptive um, and then humans have far too little energy and so they get depressed and uh, ill and cannot take care of their environments anymore. And plants will be not developing very well and the yields of the land are very low. Now, the thing is, we can act on this so and that's one of the most important tasks for uh, humankind to develop in a good way and what can we do so how can we make the energy flow so that's cutting off those suckers and that's something what is done uh, by means of uh, geomancy and um, it's something what is now developing into a proper science, also thanks to uh, the, the work of, of Dan to make it more scientifically understandable. And so we can help that things will grow. And just a little hint, these guys just in the bottom middle of the slide uh, these parasitic entities, uh, they are a nuisance for all of mankind uh, because they have, well, gained a little bit of the upper hand at the moment because so many of our energy systems are run down and then these suckers can easily uh, link in and uh, make their, um, like, uh, spaghetti lines there and people will suffer, children cannot develop right, and so on. So. Yes, uh, uh, Professor, just a, a, a quick thought here. So the, it sort of, to try to resummarize a principle that it's effectively magnetic compression or implosion that causes a seed to germinate, and that's provable even with Therify. And so, and the dodeca ecosa earth grid is, is noting the plates where places, fractal dodeca ecosa, where the magnetic lines enable that compression so-called sacred space and the ancients actually used a, a system like of valves of stone circles that act as a switch to where the magnetic lines are actually fed the plasma life force almost like an irrigation system and so even recently here in france where we had we're working on the drought issue and we found a place where there was a kind of a sacred stone circle from ancient roman times but unfortunately a railroad had cut that line and so now what's required is to, you know, put a new stone, stone circle, add more symmetry, add more implosion, and reawaken the broken magnetic line. And that is literally fertility. Exactly. I'm so glad you brought this up. Yeah. No, absolutely. And I will go uh, more in this because this is so crucial also for our uh, agriculture and uh, the water cycle and uh, healthy forests and everything. 
and uh, actually the uh, work on these uh, stone circles um, I wanted to include a picture but I didn't manage to get the picture taken because the way the pathway there were to to totally muddy so I didn't dare to go in with my car and um, so um, the thing is that working with these energy lines so they come from the nodes and then there is in extensive networks all around and we have the big lines and the small lines and many of those are compromised and now I'm a geomancer since 30 years and I have reached quite a okay level um, so there are many many much better uh, geomancers but um, I can I can do my stuff and I was last year getting a kick in the ass to take care of the energy lines I didn't volunteer for that but it was like thrown on me <laughs> and now uh, I'll do another uh, story and that's the story of uh, Helgoland and that's an island uh, a German island and um, the I'll show you a picture so this is uh, in the North Sea and uh, this island is basically amazing from from nature uh, and I had uh, 40 four uh, days holiday uh, with my girlfriend we had a great time fantastic weather outside every day and um, then um, the uh, well the thing was that I checked my own energy level daily and that's I would recommend this to everybody because if you keep your energy high you don't get ill you don't get uh, those suckers on you and <laughs> you will be happy <laughs> and <laughs> and and then um, after the second day on this island as I said absolutely great time and no no, no hustle and uh, meeting the seals and all, everything so it was really a great time but the second day I realized my energy was whew, almost gone and I, I I was stunned because I didn't really find a reason I I tried the 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 typical things is there somebody sucking me out no it was not the case and after a lot of question and answer um, I found out that um, what was sucking my energy was an energy line that goes through Helgoland Island. And this energy line was bleeding out or so so much uh, down in its energy supply that the whole island was very low energy. And once I realized this, I had a look from the hotel over the island. I thought, oh, wow, now I understand. Because if anybody knows Helgoland people are sort of oh, very very gray and not a lot of happiness there and so that's a typical uh, result of low energy environments and so to cut this story a bit short I wanted to uh, resolve the problem so I was going to this um, energy line uh, you, you to do this on a map with your with the, uh, with the pinky, you can feel this, the chakra on your pinky. You feel where the energy line is, funnily, on the map of the tourist office. <laughs> and show, so uh, it showed me the energy line was going through the, well, the, 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 the little city there on the island, not too far away from the hotel. Uh, but uh, when I checked for where the leak is, where the energy is, is, is sucked off, uh, to, to my dismay, it was in the middle of the pedestrian area that was in the evening crowded with people. So I had to go into the crowds there uh, and, uh, well, nobody knew me there, so I, I didn't care too much. But um, then I found the place where the energy was sucked. And, uh, well, there are some techniques in geomancy where we can cut that off. And so I did. And um, then the energy level was rising from like 30% to around 60%. And uh, so that was a relief. And uh, so 
uh, that job was done. And then um, a thought came to me. Those of you who know history, uh, Helgoland was bombed beyond anything what makes any rational sense. So they, they put 10,000 of tons of bombs on that island after the wo uh, Second World War. And that was the Brits doing it. And guess what? It wouldn't have made any sense. So the history says they wanted to make Helgoland disappear, what was ridiculous because that's, it's not that small. So that was clear that couldn't happen. And now I saw these energy suckers that are parasitic, they can only reach these high voltage lines when the voltage is pushed down in this case, by traumatization, by bombs. <laughs> and so now I understood, okay, 20, 30,000 tons of bombs to get those suckers on this line. And it had worked, unfortunately. But luckily, few geomancers can just reverse that and they will not have the chance to throw the bombs again, I guess. So oh, that's... Uh, I imagine the, yeah. the bombs had probably a lot of metal in them, but also, do you do you want to give us just a little clue about what the actual uh, technique for disconnecting the parasite was? Oh, sure, yeah. Uh, yeah, this is something where uh, you have to protect yourself very well. So a clairvoyant lady later told me this could have killed you, and uh, another geomancer reassured me, no, when you're doing this from your heart, uh, you are protected. So pr protection is crucial. Uh, but I ask for the help of uh, angels. So Archangel Michael in this case, the one with the sword <laughs> and his uh, folk. And the folk is plentiful and very eager to help. <laughs> they enjoy to do that, actually. It's really fun to observe them doing the job. And uh, so, yes, yeah, it is sort of cutting this off with a sword and uh, having helpers there. And that was basically the job. And those of you who want to have a look, so um, the picture above is before and the picture below is after. And you can sense energy on these pictures, but like this is maybe something for stopping the video and looking for that a little bit. Now, now is something absolutely fantastic. When I prepared for this presentation, I called somebody who is from agriculture, a doctor in uh, agronomy, uh, Dr. Uwe Mielke in Germany. He's a consultant for agriculture and he is also a geomancer in a great scientific method of geomancy that is called Neue Geomantie. And I asked him for giving me some examples for this very presentation that I'm giving. And I was overwhelmed when he told me some of these examples. And the picture to the left is the field as it is or as it has been. To the right, the, the picture on the right-hand side is the part of the field, a plot, that he has uh, balanced energetically and made it more vibrant. And you can also sense this in the picture if you, um, if you have a little bit of training. And uh, those who want to um, look a little bit more have included a little bit of text, but I don't want to go further. But the thing is that Uwe was saying that bes be be besides all the things you can improve in agriculture, and he is a prof in a uh, professional in agriculture, and he said that energetic clearing is the most important and efficient way to better yields and quality including a better nutrient density, better taste, and all. And he himself has moved a lot to work with uh, animal cages that are often absolutely catastrophic in their energies, and clearing reduces the pain. And then we should move away from this, uh, this type of practice. So 
that is something what is great and it's spreading. So there are more examples. So there is a vineyard in, um, well, southwestern Germany towards France. And uh, this is a um, farmer um, uh, who, who, who makes wine, who is also a geomancer and has great uh, experience with that. And also here in a um, fruit orchard in uh, northern Germany, they also work with uh, geomancy. And I will uh, tell you about this method briefly so that you find some sources there. And the thing is, in my point of view, uh, we need scientific geomancy. And so <laughs> here, of course, uh, Dan Winter, uh, my hero in this field and my teacher, um, this is, of course, something where we can uh, have a lot of like scientific um, support. And uh, there is also another uh, electrical engineer, Rainer Gebensleben, an Austrian, uh, who has written a very thick book, 600 page book about formulas on uh, geomancy and what he is calling uh, hyper um, hypersound. Uh, very interesting, but it's like the com his formulas are too complicated. And so I prefer the more simple uh, approaches of Dan. And so there is the saying, a uh, simple model may be right. Complicated one never is. And that's okay, from the, uh, the, from the, hypersound. Mono. the hypersound could also be an extension of the fact that sound waves are mostly longitudinal in their component. And if you get the longitudinal component electromagnetic, then you get more uh, plant growth. So effectively oh, looking yeah. at the symmetry of the magnetic lines, which create a oh, longitudinal yeah. coherence. So they kind oh. of fit together, I think. Yeah, great. So now uh, the structures of planet Earth or uh, energy grid and this is something where this Neue Geomantie is fantastic. Bad news for those not speaking German. This book is unfortunately not translated. I strongly recommend that somebody goes there because absolutely outstanding. And so the structures of the energy flows uh, that are known, uh, Hartmann grid, Curry grid, uh, lightning grid, uh, probably many of you know this, they have looked at this more closely and uh, they have explained this uh, more in detail. What they found, this is not harmful when it is not compromised. So if the energy is really flowing, this is supporting our energy. And now uh, I don't want to go too long, so it's another 10 minutes if that is okay. Oh, please, please, uh, yeah. The Just amazing mention, thing, now, now look at this grid. That's the grid what the uh, geomancers all, ar all around the world are having. Now they looked further. They do it in a scientific way. Werner Hartung and Anne Stahlkamp. And now get the surprise. Wow, these are the fine structures. This becomes beautiful. And if you look even closer, more intrinsic um, lines and it's 12 of them and these are the 12 um, uh, qualities of these uh, of the the rays the 12 rays and connected every one of them is connected to one of the archangels that represent the earth energies uh, yeah and uh, this is something what I can really um, highly recommend and they offer trainings as well and then another thing, besides the energy suckers I've been talking about, we have another huge problem on this planet, and that is that the people that are dying are often not dying successfully, as Dan would put it, but that they are dying in a traumatized way and don't find their way. And uh, Anja Revinius, uh, she works since 10 years with releasing the earthbound deceased humans and also animals. And she has experience with um, those that are 
um, in agriculture. So there are uh, farms she has uh, worked with that were sort of doing everything right. One biodynamic farm in the in the west of Germany, near Cologne, and things didn't develop. So they were near bankrupt, and uh, they they had lots of problems. And then she, the only thing she did, that's what her profession is, become that since 10 years, she is uh, like freeing the, uh, the spirits of the deceased. And that's a big, big, big task. There are millions and millions stuck in the land, in houses, and that makes life miserable, and they are disrupting a lot of stuff. After she has done that, so people that have died hundreds of years ago, partly in old wars, uh, and when they were released, uh, this farm was uh, experiencing better growth. Uh, there was a severe drought that year, and the neighbor with the same soil, the same cultures, had no yield anymore. And that farm, after the clearing, had 70% of the yield, what was unheard of under such conditions. And the family of the farmer came back, so the children came back that had uh, cut the contact. Uh, the wife that had been chronically ill was uh, recovering and all that. So there we have another big task. So a lot to do. We need a few more people or a few million people or several millions. And we, so we need... We should we should speak to the physics of that just briefly, just to say that we're quite clear that what enables entry into the lucid dream and therefore into successful death is basically it's a compressed longitudinal array, Wizard of Oz, Emerald City. And that compressed longitudinal array is the charge distribution, which is fertility. So obviously, if there's too many stuck ghosts in the land, the physics fits Professor Ralph's desc description exactly. And uh, so that, that's something we should, uh, just to mention also, Professor Ralph, that, you know, uh, Stefan Cardinal's geobiology school, uh, our golden mean that emphasizes geobiology, they have identified the actual frequency and metal, which most deflected the hartman Perry curry palm lines. And so there's an advanced French geobiology tradition like the German. Yeah. No, that's uh, also a very, very old tradition. So this uh, releasing the, the souls of the deceased ones, uh, I did this in um, uh, in Switzerland uh, uh, last year before I visited <laughs> you in southern France. I remember uh, the book. Yes. <laughs> and uh, the thing was, when I did this, uh, members of the group. So I do the, I teach this to like groups of maximum forty people. And when I did this, uh, an old lady was saying, in the old days. This was something what many people did. They were praying for the deceased ones to be freed. <laughs> so a tradition to take up again. And now some final slides to uh, wrap this up. Um, these energy structures. So this, this is a huge, huge, huge energy structure in Germany, 20 kilometers wide and around 6,000 years old. And... 12 uh, monumental uh, sites, uh, almost all of them natural. And if you connect them, they all meet in one point. And in this one point, ancient cultures have put a rock uh, because they knew. And we are at the moment working on uh, like making this vibrant again. And so this is part of the work to bring back the energy into the regions. And now a few practical hints before we before I wrap up my presentation. Of course, we can discuss how can we work in practice. And um, we need a scientific structure of the levels, physical, etheric, emotional, mental, cosmic. And we have proven tools for what to do and for verification. And for all of that, we need a reliable test system. And this is uh, one of the crucial things, because uh, if we can measure, it's a lot more easy. So test systems, the old um, rods or um, things that can be used. Uh, myself, I, I use this uh, pendulum. 
uh, and uh, a trained human perception is superb. Especially multiply, multiple trained humans form amazing systems for qualitative and quantitative appraisal of situations. And this is crucial. And uh, so there is one thing that if you are testing something, there are parasitic entities that don't like to be trapped or to be released. Uh, many want to be released, but often they try to avoid to be, uh, to be seen. And so they will influence your testing. So you have to, in, to create a space that is shielded from manipulation. So like imagine a space free of manipulation filled with the power of source, what are, whatever, or like I declare this a pristine and protected space. Only use positive words, please. And then when we are in, a, in an area, I will skip this, uh, where do we start? Then we can test. And we should always try to find the most crucial thing in the place. Otherwise, we work on small stuff and don't get to the crucial ones. And if we not... We don't, if we don't make the, the big things first, the rest of it will not last. And so there is a lot to be done. And also with the structures that we have, like um, the, the wind energy installations are geometrically catastrophic and relatively difficult to be balanced, but it also can be done. So if there is a problem, there is always a solution. Sometimes it takes a bit to find it. And now if we um, start working, uh, the first question, am I, are we allowed and capable to handle this? Else, check further. Second question, what of what I, we can do has the highest priority for healing this situation in the region? And always ask, do we know more? Do we need to know more? And also anything else that needs to be done now, because we need to make a complete job there. And with that, we can go into any landscape and uh, do miracles. And so that's the eighth element of regenerative agriculture. The most important factor is the free flow of vital energy. And the science for that is geomancy and uh, in France called geobiology. Because geomancy uh, in French is like throwing bones of dead chicken and reading the future. So geobiology for our French friends. And uh, yeah, there is also like methods to increase the energy. Also ancient methods that are very doable. And so uh, eight elements of regenerative agriculture makes high nutrient density. Uh, once again, reverse the loss of mental acuity <laughs> and the brain is uh, plastic, so it can be recovered. And uh, with high vital energy, we can get a balanced weather and restoring the water cycles. And here are the elements. I just keep them briefly on the screen that you can like look at them from the video if you like. Otherwise, I can send you a PDF. And so if we make everything right, uh, this is the Bionutrient Food Association, Dan Kittredge, absolutely great man from Massachusetts, uh, Eastern UA USA. And he has found that uh, there is such a wide range of uh, nutrient density in foods that we can really um, find good stuff with the BRICS device and else we are lost. Little hint, we need urgently DHA, EPA fatty acids to keep our brain functioning and to keep and to develop the brains of the newborns and the children. And uh, vitamin D, obviously, and um, then to wrap this up, um, DHA, EPA fatty acids, we can do aquaculture for that. For dealing with water, of course, we use uh, water vortex. Um, here, the developments of uh, 
Dan and team, and uh, I have this uh, triple imploder that I really like, and uh, then, of course, the Therafy, and there we can uh, put the conscious plasma fields, so our consciousness is to interact, so we can ask specific tasks, and um, yeah, uh, and uh, now also uh, quantify. I'm curious for that. And uh, then we should include trees, edible trees especially. And trees are also repairing the energy grids. So that's something with a win-win situation. My own approach to um, the, um, like how to approach it, it, that we make so many small family uh, gardening operations that we have a nice environment with maybe a hundred of those um, small farms so that we have a nice neighborhood and then we can uh, create uh, what I call garden communities and that is uh, my book on that and this is uh, well like uh, a book where we can find really the uh, ways how to make great life options for those people who want to do something uh, with the land, making great food and developing themselves and like have the mix of working uh, with, um, well, with the hands and with the brain. So desk and garden combines very well. And that is my experience. So get this book. There is a lot more in that. And with that, I want to thank you. And this is where we go. <laughs> uh, thank you, Professor Ralph. That was fabulous. You're a real inspiring hero, sir, if I do say so myself. <laughs> really, <laughs> sir. And um, your, your courage, your dedication, and the way you've branched out in all these areas is so inspiring. So if you, if you do choose to uh, share the PDF, we could put a, as a link on your lecture here, if you like, to share that PDF. And thank you again so much. And uh, Tufan, do you want to uh, choreograph a little question Q and A here? Then, sure. Um, uh, there are many questions. Uh, one of them, Melina asks to Professor Ralph, "Do you know if lichens that are mutation blend of a fungus and cyanobacteria is bad for trees and soils?" Ah. Uh Sorry, I don't know that. So uh, we could always ask uh, if this is something that is hurting uh, the soil or is it uh, helping it? So we have our test system, so like uh, this pendulum, so we could ask with inner connection. So that can be manipulated easily, but we get this uh, more uh, balanced if several people check and then we have like if if nine of, out of ten people say it's a big problem uh, we should avoid this and uh, then we can try to find a way to heal and like as the uh, consciousness is above the material uh, we will find ways <laughs> i think since so, so many plants benefit i mean animals benefit from eating the lichen i'm sure it's useful but but please go go ahead to the next one then too fun thank you um jane asks sorry Christopher Christoph Weigert asks Dan. Um, Dan mentioned that when we cut veggies, etc., they lose charge. What about cut up and then fermented cabbage or whatever you can ferment? Does it reattract charge while it's fermenting? Um, what you know, we had talked about like a ceramic knife leaves more capacitance when you cut the carrot than a metal. Uh, but and yes, in general. Uh, many kinds of fermentation are obviously beneficial, and I'm sure sure Professor Ralph can speak to that. There is also lacto fermentation, where it's fermented with less oxygen. But fermentation in general uh, serves many useful functions, from cabbage to sauerkraut, and and Germans know all about that. So yes, absolutely, I'm sure there are, and I believe true. It would also be true that the place where you ferment. Like if the fermentation is on a magnetic line cross, et cetera. So yes, fermentation as a technique for gaining charge could be a fascinating field. Very appropriate. Go ahead. Next question there, uh, Wouldn't it be good to drop all this knowledge that Ralph is giving at the current farmers' protests that go on 
all over Europe. So you'd reach the perfect audience in one spot. We need to send yeah, this video actually, to the farmers and their tractors. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's actually what I what I have started to do. I've put a, a video in my uh, YouTube channel in Germany. Uh, it's gotten quite a bit of um, attention. And I, I tell the farmers, uh, your protest must, must go further. So you must really require that uh, regenerative practices is teached at universities. How can universities for public money make propaganda for agrochemical uh, companies that destroy humankind? That's not acceptable. And I don't uh, accept this anymore. So, and, and then also that uh, these protests can be used as schools so when these farmers meet, they can have their trainings together. And so that would be a great opportunity. <laughs> nice, yes. So instead of the university, agri-universities teaching, you know, agribusiness, they teach regenerative agriculture. And Professor Ralph is the example. It's true that we have to comp have compassion. The farmers have been squeezed badly. And so this is a very tricky situation. And we send compassion. But thank you. Yes. Yeah, so absolutely. Yeah. Go, go ahead, Tufan. Um, I will ask if you have heard of green garden vertical farming concept, soilless farming with great nutrient score thanks to harmonic frequency and improved water quality via photon integrator. You know, uh, yeah, there are some, uh, some things like that. Uh, that is something where uh, I have a little disagreement with that this is very high nutrient density because like plants better grow in natural sunshine. Uh, but of course, you can compensate for some of these losses with uh, proper approaches. The tricky thing is to get all the uh, trace elements in there uh, because those uh, will be lacking if you don't have living soil. So the beauty of living soil is that we have biological activity there, and that includes the biological uh, transmutation. And uh, with that, we have uh, well, all the elements that are uh, necessary. And this is something what can be really, really uh, better than stuff we grow indoors, what may be sometimes also, also good. Yeah, but Dan, you wanted to comment as well. Oh, no, I, I agree with you. You know, sometimes we call it Vitruvian Gardens vertical uh, and they integrate the greenhouse vertical with uh, pisciculture fish. There are lots of techniques, but I still agree with Professor Ralph's essential comment here that living soil is the ultimate and there there's mm -hmm. a maximum source of charge in the natural condition. So, you know, the synthetic is okay, but <laughs> go ahead, Tufa, yeah. next question. Thank you. So would granite obelisks propagate the helpful plasma around the growing area, maybe via piezoelectric effect? Yeah, so it, you know, geomantically, uh, a granite obelisk is serving a function, perhaps analogous to the pin in moxibustion acupuncture. So by restoring conductivity at a, a vertex node in a longitudinal array, you could restore distribution in an area of that array. Uh, so there'd be many... And the paramagnetic function of those those granite obelisks are well researched. Did you want to say something about that, Professor Ralph? Or? Oh, that's uh, where I learned from you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you. Go go ahead, Tufan. Trevor asks if Professor Ralph uses his pinky finger to feel the energy of the energy lines. Did you really use your little finger? <laughs> yeah, uh, it's like we have, uh, like if, I, if I'm in the field, I, I use my hand, obviously, or uh, divining rods are good for ley lines and stuff. Uh, for like en elemental beings don't like that. Uh, so there it's better having direct perception or using your hands. Uh, but on, uh, on maps, we can get orientation. So when we search... Uh, for ley lines in, in a region, we take a very detailed map where we also have these old uh, stone circles and all that uh, that are uh, ridiculously called grave graveyards, what is absolutely a disgrace. Uh, it's like uh, highly qualified energy, energetic structures. <laughs> and we do repair, repair work on, on, on those. And so if we have such a map, we can sort of... Um, feel the energy on the map 
and we have uh, chakras on our fingertips. And if we uh, use our fingertip uh, and, well, our searching is ley line. Where is the ley, ley line? I will find little tingling or for some people it's like feeling uh, warm a little bit or like for me it's a little bit of a resistant, like the air is a little bit thicker there. And so that gives me a hint. And then we can go uh, to the field and we know roughly where to go. And then we're, there we can either use the rods, but uh, luckily now I'm also, after getting this job in uh, Helgoland Island, uh, I'm, I'm also given the, uh, uh, well, the capacity to, to see these lines in the fields or to perceive them. It's not seeing, actually. It's more feeling them. Thank you. I, I love it. Uh, you know, the, uh, Biggie is asking down below, uh, not to jump ahead too far, but is the map a 2D fractal of the 3D reality? Or when does the map become the terrain? <laughs> well, <you> know, <laughs> but if you have a very, high, a very high quality map, which also represents the stone and the other energies, and then you invest it with that intention, in that sense, the map almost does become the terrain. Map dousing is a very famous and well-documented skill, actually. And I'm rem reminded by your pinky story of the famous children in Mexico who are documented seeing through their fingertips. Hello. <laughs> go ahead, uh, Tufan, go ahead. Is there... um, a question asks if geomancy is similar to biogeometry. Yeah, well, you know, we knew uh, a professor in uh, in each of their biogeometry very well, and uh, you know, he I think is similar to Wilhelm Reich, who didn't actually learn what a capacitor is. So Reich called it orgone, and he called it biogeometry. It's actually implosive capacitance. That's the key to life force in general, obviously, and centripetal force generated. And if you do that on a large scale, well, that's what geobiology is on the land. So these these concepts all go together with the unified field idea that whether you call it plasma or charge, it's a symmetry array of the superfluid we call charge or capacitance or implosion that en enables the circulation and perfected circulation is not only fractal, that's literally what the word heaven means. So anyway, go ahead, Tufan. Um, are there any geomancers in Norway? A question. Uh, absolutely. Uh, geomancers are all around the world. There is the Live Net Geomancy, what is uh, also pretty international. And um, it's sometimes the names are, are different. So it's like you, you could. Uh, there is uh, the, the people that are using rods and looking for water veins, uh, they are typically not called geomancers, uh, but it's more the people that are also looking at uh, the like uh, conscious entities like elemental beings, water beings and, and earth beings and so on. And uh, so, yeah, look for different names for that and uh, for uh, you will find people like that everywhere. And it's often also a traditional old culture that has been uh, lost. So, so it's like, I guess. Yeah. Uh, and one thing I, I would like to add, so that there is something that is absolutely new and that is so encouraging, the interest in geomancy. I do this since 30 years. 30 years ago, nobody knew what that is. You were considered crazy when you, when you mentioned that at all. Now, when I give classes, uh, there are like 40 people all of a sudden and more would like to sign in and like in switzerland i had a full room of people that were like all more like business people and like from field of finance they are intrigued and this was sort of giving them sort of a feeling wow the world is much more interesting than i ever thought and it's getting to the farmers now. So the farmers' uh, experience of, of Dr. Uwe, uh, whom I mentioned, is that farmers are very open to this, and especially the, the agrochemical farmers. And he <laughs> says when he, when he heals the land and he heals the family, then these people will also start to think about improving the soil. <laughs> 
Uh, that's wonderful, Dr. Ralph. You really are a hero. It's true that the geomancy is really just a name for the living bloodstream of charge that is your body and the earth. And the circulation between them, obviously, is the healing that becomes centripetal and fractal. And mm -hmm. Wonderful. Uh, any last ones there, uh, Tufan? How are we doing? Um, we have a few more. Um, can you recommend a source to learn more about geomancy and how to heal the land of parasitic energy drainers? Well, that's, there is a, a lack of, of, of schools. So it's like uh, we do have uh, quite a few, say, famous geomancers uh, that are doing so advanced stuff that beginners can't really get into it. And that's why I have started to give these beginners classes myself to, to teach people the basics. And uh, as I'm... Uh, mostly still working in the German speaking field. I want to go more into French and English now, uh, but like this uh, book, uh, Neue Geomantie, for those uh, speaking uh, German, is fantastic. And I, I don't know if there is something like that in, uh, in English. I doubt it because this is very high quality. And uh, there. There must be much more coming, but but I think the growing interest will also spike this because now people can easily make a living from uh, making geomancy, and there are geomancers specializing on geomancy for farms, and it works. There, there is demand, and uh, so this will also make more uh, learning opportunities. Uh, you can just ask people who do that if you can become an intern. So just join them for if they do field work and learn from them and, and help them out a bit. Yes, we uh, worked with Stefan Cardino, Lausanne, uh, Switzerland for many years, who we thought was the most advanced geomanter, well, geobiology school in Europe. And interestingly, some references there at goldenmean.info slash geobiology. The interesting story was he was a student of mine in Switzerland, and then he had a Kundalini experience, and then he began to clairvoyantly see all the magnetic lines, and he was a consultant for archaeologists, and it was a wonderful story. Anyway, yeah. uh, that was great. So, too fun, yes? Um, Erton Hand asks Professor Ralph if he's available to consult on projects around the world regarding clearing land, energy balancing, and site design? Uh, yeah, I, I normally don't do that. Uh, what I do is that I would take on such projects if it is becoming a seminar. So I would uh, encourage people who want to do something to gather enough people uh, that are interested in the topic and then it becomes a like field work with seminar because I, I want to teach this to people. So I, I don't have the time to make uh, individual projects. Uh, but uh, like if there is uh, enough people interested in doing something that can be done. And yeah, I'm, I'm open to this and like in uh, English, French and German and Dutch also. But uh, yeah, would be great. <laughs> Um, I think um, uh, ahead, maybe then. just to speak to uh, Bob, who said, can Dan elaborate about map mapping your room to remap your bed, your house and your village so it all looks like a rose? Well, step one, the simple step actually is find where there is a very strong magnetic line and learn that when you walk over it, you will feel something. You can have your hands out on your side, relax, feel a little tingle in your fingertips. So practice feeling that over a very strong magnetic line, and then gradually your skill to feel these magnetic lines increase. Eventually, as in my case, if I walk up to a huge field and I ask, where is the magnetic cross? Suddenly, I have a point, I go right to it. So you begin to feel this in your body. So then eventually with that magnetic map, you begin to get the idea of what's broken and what does not look like a rose. And you can set about, you know, realigning the stones and the things that, that repair the magnetic circulation. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And also like children are great at that. So when I do my, my geomancy classes, I tell people, bring your children. <laughs> and uh, so so they are for them it's very natural <laughs> that's beautiful that's beautiful uh, do we have last questions too fun sure um 
can we use magnetic pad that is used under beds to bring back the magnetism in places it has been degraded? How about using harmonizers made of copper? Can we use electroculture that uses copper spirals and rods to correct the soil and energize plants? Um, you know, the electroculture rods, et cetera, they can increase the depth of carrots, for example, because they increase that, uh, that literally that voltage difference that allows the carrot to penetrate deeper. Uh, however, ultimately, that needs to be part of the symmetry of a larger pattern in order for the rose effect, <laughs> the fractal effect, to take over. So you kind of need a bigger map to get to see if that's actually fitting the context of feeding the land. Did you want to say something, Ralph, on that? Yeah, like uh, I, I, for like uh, putting something under your bed or things like that, be very cautious, please. Uh, there is a lot of nonsense and there is also very harmful nonsense there. So some people do something what is well meant, but expensive, but really, really harmful. And so always when something is done, uh, does it really do you well? Some people think because it was expensive, it must be good, and they lie to themselves even if they get sick. And so ask somebody else, uh, learn yourself how to sense these energies. And that's what I really like also, like uh, Dan was saying, uh, just train yourself, know a line somewhere and, 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 and get that training. And the, the basic thing, like geomancy, it's, it's feeling the earth. We all can feel the earth when we are somewhere in a forest and it's beautiful and we love it. That's feeling the surroundings. And, and so it's nothing uh, much theoretical. It's, it's more or less to get a, get a concept and, and, and do it. <laughs> yeah, and I would agree also that you know, the magnetic pad can restore some short-term circulation, but long-term use of magnetic pads, there's other issues that your, your magnetism has to breathe with the body and then breathe with the earth. And externally applied magnetic fields could maybe be a short-term kick to some circulation, but in the long-term embedding is the solution and not, for example, a Faraday cage. So mm -hmm. we should we should kind of wind up too fun. Do we have any final things you have? Or um, we have three more questions. Uh, one is regarding the carbon. Uh, seems go, interesting. Go ahead, go ahead. Asks, go ahead. Don't, we need, don't we actually need carbon to help the earth regreen and naturally balance the ecosystem and weather? Yeah, I yeah mean, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So, so regenerative agriculture brings the carbon contents in the soil up very, very fast. And that has proven, has been proven all over. So if any of the politicians or the NGOs that are pretending to be so concerned about climate, that tool is absolutely there. Uh, but hardly anybody is pushing that because that's uh, sort of the field of agrochemical companies. And now instead of attacking them, what's not really fun, uh, I suggest to go for uh, regenerative agrochemical companies that bring in the trace elements and that make good real uh, consultancy instead of just selling uh, harmful stuff all the time. And so that would be a step uh, so, sort of where business could be new. So yeah, thank you for that. So increasing carbon is, is great. We could have a shortage of CO2. So that's one of the risks we have. Uh, and that's well, dangerous. That's yeah, all yeah. life will stop when we have a lack of CO2, and we are very low already. <laughs> well, it, 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 to be clear, that the carbon in the soil, especially available carbon in the soil, is absolutely magic, no question. In fact, it was said to be the secret of the most fertile soil ever existing on planet Earth called Terra Preta, available carbon, which had to do with the way you burnt the wood, lacking oxygen to make available carbon. Very interesting story. But anyway, last question, Zufan. Um, um, let's see. So Jane asks how to contact geomancers for farms. Well, I think uh, Ralph just it, it kind of went through that a little bit, that there are groups all over the world doing that. Learn the local terms for that. But is that right, Ralph? 
Yeah, that's right. Uh, uh, geomancy for farms is sort of taking off now, but not it's since long. So yeah, I ask right. normal geomancers if they can work on the field. And also the people that look for water veins or something, they could also look for the energy lines and check uh, how much energy they have. They usually use some, some unit there. Uh, so that could be like also until you have real uh, 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 geomancers for the fields to ask those guys to, to work on that. And, and, and Oscar at the bottom here says, is there a difference between ley lines and dragon lines? What are the etymological meanings? Well, obviously, the magnetic lines are life. And there are a thousand ways you can name that life force. Certainly, dragon current is one of them. And yes, there are, you know, my friend David Yero wrote the book Dragon in the Ice Castle, which he claims to have seen the dragon current leave the land and fly literally like a dragon. And in fact, in a very living environment, these magnetic lines literally come alive and you can talk to them. In fact, a good dowser doesn't move the water vein back into a well with a, with a hammer, piezo. He moves the water vein back into the well by talking to it. So on that note... <laughs> I think we should call that a happily ever after. <laughs> I, 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 yeah, I think we really want to thank Dr. Ralph. I really think you're a hero, Ralph, and we're happy to share this for you. Uh, so I just let's give Professor Ralph. Uh, yes, <laughs> you are a hero. Ralph, so a hero. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, and uh, also thank you very much for setting up uh, Fractal U. It's it's great uh, fun. Also, the other presentations. I'm looking forward also to the other ones. So. Uh, absolutely fantastic and yeah education must be from the people for the people and uh, if the others do things for business only we can have the fun of really working for people working for nature and uh, yeah also coming together in these fields and also making local groups and doing this type of work Beautiful. thank you very much for inviting me and it was my pleasure and then uh bye bye have a nice bye -bye. Uh, evening day wanted... whatever it is in your time zone <laughs> bye bye if you, want to, if you want to send your your powerpoint as a pdf we'll put it as a link with this if you can so thank you yeah. everyone thank you tufan blessings blessings we'll see you next week thank with patrick you. more fun to come it's been a blessing thank what wonderful you. energy bye -bye. Really. thank you guys and there's so many smiles out there I love those smiles. <laughs> Thanks, guys. <laughs> See you next time. <laughs>